everyone. Um, welcome back to the MarTech Fridays by Exchange for Media, a platform specially curated by Exchange for Media for marketing and digital professionals, uh, whereby we discuss marketing and technologies that are kind of coming around. Today's agenda is about maximizing data ROI, aligning data and business strategy to drive growth and profitability. Pretty, pretty interesting. We have an eclectic mix of panel represented very well by brands, marketplaces, research consulting firms, and a marketing automation platform. So welcome to the panel. And I will introduce the panel to you, starting with Hitu Chavla, CMO Microsoft. Um, Hitu is spearheading the marketing efforts at Microsoft in India. She drives the curation of engaging customer experiences deepening the intersection of marketing and sales to deliver tangible business outcomes. A firm believer of modern marketing, she leverages data to make a wider impact, driving growth of the business and the brand. In her previous role, she served at Microsoft US as senior director of the partner go-to-market vertical, McKinsey and Company, and 3Com India. Itu has donned different hats from strategy, consulting, business and channel management. She's led brand marketing and go-to-market initiatives in India and the US. Passionate about mentoring the new generation of business and marketing leaders, she's a strong advocate of women driving impact in senior leadership roles. In her free time, Hitu enjoys dancing, adventure sports, and hiking. Welcome on board, Hitu. Thank you so much, Onya. Next on board, we have Sagar Boke. Um, Shopper and customer marketing, Tata Consumer Products, accomplished CPG marketeer with experience across food and personal care brands. He's been instrumental in creation, scale up, and rejuvenation on many iconic brands like Tata Salt, Tata Sampan, Dalda, Goldbridge Number no. One. Sagar is a marketeer with a very keen ear to the ground. This comes with his experience in sales and PL management. Sagar is a great believer in digital and has taken significant initiatives in building data management platforms, content platforms, and imaginative and effective use of MarTech. He enjoys challenges that involve setting up businesses and business turnaround. Highly passionate professional with clarity of thought and direction. Welcome, Sagar. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be here. Oh, great. Next that I will introduce is Isha Nagar, Managing Director, Nipa India. Isha Nagar leads the country hat for Nipa India. Nipa is a Stockholm headquartered leading consumer science firm working on the crossroads of tech, consulting, and research. Isha has been with Nipa for the last three years. Her prior stints have been with Cantor and Nielsen, where she led the West Region media and digital practices amongst her many roles. Her work cuts across multiple verticals like consumer retail panels, digital focused solutions, path to purchase understanding, and media effectiveness. All things around content, campaigns, and marketing come from a very special passion space for Isha, coupled with her command on deciphering consumer sentiments. Welcome on board, Isha. Thank you, Sonia. Hello, everyone. Next on board, Another woman leader in, in marketing and digital, we have Anika Agarwal, CMO Max Bhupa Health. Anika is a digital and a marketing leader who joined Max Bhupa in the year 2011. With over 15 years of experience, Anika has a wealth of marketing experience across India, Middle East, and African markets. Prior to joining Max Bhupa, Anika spent more than six years in Nokia India and Nokia Corporation and a very brief stint at the Indian Cellular Association. As the head of marketing function at, at Max Bhupa, she's responsible for the overall brand strategy and marketing communication. She leads brand planning, communication, digital, and social media, consumer insights, loyalty, and CRM. That's quite a handful for you, Anika. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Yeah. Anika has an extensive portfolio of digital brand building, online sales, and lead generation. Under her leadership, Max Bhupa has won several accolades, including the coveted ET Best Brands and Super Brands Award. Welcome on board, Anika. Um, next on our panel is Sushant Mishra, Head Digital Marketing, 
Grofers, a fellow agency uh, person, colleague who's now moved to the client side. In his current role, he's heading the digital marketing strategy at Grofers and is responsible for business growth for driving acquisition and managing retention. And that is not an easy task. Before Grofers, he worked with renowned companies such as the Publicis Group, DDB Worldwide, um, and within that, Tribal DDB India. With an extensive experience of more than 15 years in the overall marketing space, Sushant has spent 12 years primarily in the digital marketing domain, leading campaigns for many reputed brands across the country. In his capacity at various organizations, he's implemented multiple MarTech solutions to steer the business, innovation, optimize consumer journeys, and increase operational efficiencies. A very warm welcome, Sushant. Good evening, everyone. Um, and the last uh, person on the panel, actually the second last, Apur Sood, Vice President of Global Business Development and Partnerships at Web WebEngage. WebEngage is a SaaS company headquartered in Mumbai, vocal for local, everyone. It is a cross-channel marketing cloud for consumer businesses with clients in close to 52 countries across the globe. Fantastic. He comes from software, SaaS, and digital advertising background with expertise in revenue expansion and go-to-market strategy. He's both visionary and practical with high levels of analytic horsepower and has the ability to turn analysis into insights and actions. He has keen understanding of market conditions, product requirement, demand for products and resource requirements, thereby creating value for his customers. He enjoys nature and all kind of outdoor activities like mountaineering, scuba diving, running, and backpacking. So welcome on board uh, as well, Apoor. And finally, me. Uh, I'm actually a serial entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, my second stint right now is with an agency that I've launched, which is called Pomelo Digital. Uh, I basically come with two decades of experience in marketing and digital. Uh, the two pillars that we offer at Pomelo is employer branding and digital marketing. I'm also on board of a new uh, tech startup in fashion, which we'll be launching soon. It's called Wardo. If I wasn't here, I'd actually be a mountain goat uh, trotting my way up the mountains. So great to have you guys on the panel. And we will move on to our questions. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll call out each one of you as I uh, put across the question. So this is really, um, you know, to all the brand leaders that are here, how are you leveraging data to drive business strategy? What is the tipping point for you to activate data-driven insights into business objectives? And I would like your perspective because each one of you either come from a B2B, B2C, and D2C background. I'll start with Hitu. Uh, Hitu, why don't you take this question and give us some insights from a B2B perspective? Happy to. So, I, uh, Sonia, I believe marketing sits at the intersection of data, business acumen, and creativity. Uh, for it to truly work, it's magic. And uh, I'll share that with a couple of examples where we saw it being stress tested in the last six months. First, uh, and importantly, I think the use of smart data actually helped us improve our response time across all facets of go-to-market. Uh, starting from, because in the current circumstances, I guess all of us had to, none of us were prepared, none of us knew what was hitting us. There wasn't like a playbook, um, everything is off the playbook is how we've executed. So I think the fact that we turned to data, uh, like I said, help us improve on all facets of go-to-market, starting from demand forecasting to product enhancement to real-time offer adjustments. Microsoft Teams is a great example because we saw a surge of almost about 12 million uh, users in a single week uh, back in March, and we could adjust our supply elasticity literally like within days. And while we have since been, uh, since then, we have been innovating in flight with ongoing featured add-ons like virtual meeting rooms, whiteboards, et cetera. And all of that is possible only when you are leaning in on what's the actual customer reality. Uh, what is it that they're looking for to enhance your product? Wh where, what is the potential demand and how much do you scale up 
uh, in terms of to be able to fulfill that. Uh, second, I would say virtual events, which all of us will relate to. We are painfully aware uh, of the virtual event fatigue, be it your first party engines or third party. I think the, uh, the best form of targeting most are able to do is which accounts to go after and probably the specific titles and personas within those accounts. But there's no way to uh, intelligently predict how many will register or how many of them will really show up. And most, um, but most mature automation tools have AI infused uh, predictive audience capability. And at, at Microsoft, we use uh, uh, Marketo. And as an example, there is a feature called Adobe Sensei. I think that's, that's how uh, the particular capability is labeled, which builds an audience list using predictive filters like likelihood to register and likelihood to attend. And it will give you alerts when a goal is predicted to be missed along with intelligent recommendations, et cetera. So, the, the fact, again, that you are leaning on technology to be able to uh, make more intelligent, informed calls in your business strategy, in your marketing strategy. So it really sits at the center of everything uh, that we do. And the last I would call out is it also allows, in, in our function specifically, it allows you to eliminate the marketing waste with that whole hit and trial approach, which in the current context, I think none of us really have the time and luxury for. Because when the lockdown first hit us, uh, I remember as a team, we had so many questions like, and given the wide uh, portfolio of products we have at Microsoft, we, were, we had questions like, which products do we prioritize uh, to take into market? What messaging do we lead with? Uh, which is whether the existence, uh, existing audience segmentation and uh, high propensity uh, data models that you have, whether they'll work or not. And the answer, and we turned to data because uh, it helped us not just answer these questions, but also be more nimble in going to market with messaging and being more per per pertinent and really being hyper-targeted. So in netting it out, data sits truly at the center of uh, all aspects of uh, business marketing or how we live today, I would say. So what is the threshold of data that you're looking at before you make a decision based on that? Just, just some insights there. Talk to me a little more when you say what is the threshold? Uh, give As me. In the, you know, in terms of sizable amount of data that's showing you, you know, that, that you believe in and then you kind of move forward on that. I think the con, so I, I, I'm not sure if there will be a straight jacketed answer to that because it's con contextual to what, what situation yes. are you trying to solve for? Right. And hence in that context, you'll see what volume of data will help you infer meaningful insights or not. Right. So I think right. it's probably more it contextual. It depend on, uh, on uh, objective to objective actually. So great, I think uh, I get a sense of how Microsoft is kind of leveraging uh, data and kind of making decisions more from a marketing standpoint. Uh, I'll move this question now to Sagar. Uh, Sagar, you come from an FMCG background and data has been something that you have to build on now because uh, FMCG is really about uh, you know, your uh, small retailers, modern retailers and things like that. You never had the data. So give, give us uh, in terms of how are you leveraging data from a, uh, from a business uh, objective? Sure. So I think uh, uh, there are various use cases of uh, data uh, in the FMCG context, as you rightly said. And uh, I, I will restrict myself to marketing and sales environment. Uh, I think first from the marketing environment, the first use case for data is to building efficiency and affinity of the consumer that you are targeting. Uh, so the whole data management platform and the creating the whole data lake, uh, I think the whole idea behind, behind it is that how do you ensure there is no duplication uh, when you are targeting? How do you ensure that the data that you are targeting is authentic and how do you ensure that uh, uh, the data that you are targeting has high affinity to the kind of customer that you are uh, that you are wanting to target. I think that's one major use case. The second use case is uh, essentially uh, the FMCG industry per se. There's a significant amount of investment that happens both on ATL and BTL. 
uh, and you know there always has been this classical fight between sales and marketing when sales wants to spend money on below the initiative promotions and marketing wants to spend money on atl uh, i think data really helps to solve it because essentially you have the data for last 3 4 years and you can exactly predict with the data as to what input has really helped you grow sales i will give an example on tata salt which is obviously one of the large brands in fmcg industry that we have we used to spend around 65% of money on on below the line promotions and uh, you know when we get got into marketing and analytics we realized that the effectiveness of that was much lower as compared to the atl investment and we cut back the money by around 35 40% over over a couple of years and it has actually helped us in increasing the sales uh not only in terms of reducing the total amount of money because there while there has been a reduction in btl investment there has been a bit of an increase in 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 atl investment so i think it 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 solves for an argument i think data is the guide point which will really clear a lot of uh, arguments that happens in the boardroom the third uh, use case is to really predict how the consumer is going to behave so we have been using social listening very extensively to really spot the trends like one of the trends couple of trends that we really pick was this whole thing after the pandemic was the spices and health we realized that the searches for uh, you know the spices and turmeric had really gone up and significant amount of marketing money on tata sampan as a brand we put there and it gave us tremendous results uh source i think people are looking at source so we got a range of sorts like himalayan rock salt we are also coming up with a sea salt which comes from the coast of coromandel i think those are the insights at ahead of the time you are really picking from the uh, picking from the uh, from the internet i think that's that's an that's a great example of how you can use data uh and the fourth use case in consumer research actually what happens in consumer research consumer never tells you what he or she really means people tell the answers which are actually you know Uh, right answers to really you know uh, basically consumers tell you the right things to uh, uh, say they will never tell you what they actually feel we have been extensively using the neural research because your while while uh, you know your uh, your voice can lie but your mind can never lie so we have all our ad testing packaging research uh, 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 or our retail panogramming we have been using data there uh, neural research really and you know that has not only helped us uh, save a lot of time and also as the results have been perfect and the fourth use case in go to market because what happens in go to market uh, in fmcg since you are spending significant amount of money uh, in non performance marketing or awareness so the what happens because of that while your cost of acquisition is lower there is significant leakage that happens within the uh, uh, in the entire funnel so how do you look at build a entire value chain from the factory till the till the end retailer wherein you are ensuring that the supply losses are minimized uh, i think there are significant use of data which really helps you to do that so i would say among various things uh, uh, you know these are the four or five things which between sales and marketing have significantly helped us to uh, to build a robust uh, business growth great i think you've been leveraging data in all facets uh, uh, you know from social listening to actually looking at your spends by way of btl atl prioritizing that i'll take this question now to uh, apoorv um yes so yeah super so i think uh, yeah so what i what i have kind of you know in a way noticed per se overall is catching up from sagar you know when the lockdown started you know suddenly i think the only category that was selling was groceries right so i saw suddenly businesses actually uh, trying to become grocers and actually every business from a travel to everybody else wanted to survive and start selling groceries overall so the good news overall all of that piece is that you know while grocery was the largest selling category and actually is by the globally supermarkets the largest category selling online today uh, from a business standpoint what has interestingly happened is how uh, the percentage of online purchase behavior that has changed right for example earlier total online sales versus uh, you know your sales which was uh, total sales versus online sales you will see a bracket of 8 to 15% or globally right now suddenly this is jumped from anywhere between 22% to 25 26% which is a jump like within last couple of 5 to 6 months right so that's great one the overall strength of this whole uh, segment retail e-commerce is right now at about 3.53 trillion globally right that's immense amount of you know uh, you know traction online so one statement i would want to make is while omni channel is increasingly becoming more relevant 
but if you today across the platter whether you're an automobile business whether you're a supermarket you're a grocer you're a travel you're a you're a, you're a digital services business or you're a you're a, you're a, you know you're a bfsi banking finance business or a financial technology business if you're not online i don't think in the near terms you're going to be relevant because today with pandemic one thing that it's shown us is that you know probably physical real estate is important but digital real estate is even more important now we are bringing in services to people rather than you know we have the services but if we don't take them to people i don't think we'll be able to survive and scale and overall uh, what i've also seen what i've seen is you know like the mobile growth has also increased you know the way uh, people are using mobile you know today 51% of the entire traffic globally is mobile so if you don't have an app or you don't have a mobile sensitive website and you're not engaging with users you're not talking to them proactively across platforms across channels whether in terms of a brand conversation or whether in terms of a purchase conversation or whether in terms of an advocacy or a, you know or a feedback conversation i don't think you will be relevant in the present times so the good news overall is that yes there is buying which has come back from a sudden null of no buying happening um, online platforms like us which is web engage and a lot of other products have become more uh, important uh, what i feel uh, i think the struggle going forward per se on a data side would be i think people yet as you know rightly mentioned by sagar the data lake right we yet don't know how to sync together an entire 360 degree user profile with all right nuances underneath because if we don't have that i don't think we can see data in the right way we want to in terms of analytics and trends and so on and so forth and the trends we need to make realities right if what is the point of a trend which is not actionable right so if i see you know like a bounce rate is about 40 50% i need to do something about it that's the game right so i think three key pieces that i feel one making sure that we have the right data in the right format at the right place in a 360 degree fashion as a form of a data lake both online and offline together because you have the same customer with online and omni channel experiences it's not two different users uh, number two is how do we see those trends across you know the funnel or whatever you want to call and three is how do we leverage that data or insights to make them actionable to you know you know convert the user and then repurchase and promote advocacy brand and so on and so forth so that's my kind of take on what it looks like today right apur we will come back to you with a follow up question but i'll take this and move this to anika now uh, uh, wherein uh, again you know we are seeing uh, as in health uh, you know and in health insurance what is it that you are doing you are sitting on a landmine of data you have a lot of data uh, sure. what is changing for you now uh, in terms of data driven strategies so uh, you know covid hasn't really changed anything frankly if you were in that business before you've sort of just expedited your journeys so sagar spoke about the data lake apur spoke about the data lake i think the single biggest thing uh, that we've done in the last 12 months or so is to get a unified view of our customer data and when we say that we're sitting on a mine of uh, information about our customers that's actually true because when we onboard a customer we have a lot of personal and demographic information along with that we have a lot of health information of our customers and as customers stay with us for longer we actually accumulate a lot of data about them so what we've done as first steps actually is having a unified data lake in place with all these variables thrown in i would not go in a lot of detail uh, sonia on a lot of use cases because everyone's covered but right. from a digital business and use case point of view we take a three pronged approach we build use cases for customer uh, acquisition we build use cases for customer experience and we build use cases for efficiency so whether it is growing the funnel or whether it is improving cost efficiencies on that funnel or driving up experience and hence improving conversions i think that's the three pronged layer uh, sort of use cases that we speak about and execute in the business uh i just have one question when is this going to be a reality where uh, since you gather a lot of uh, information in terms of health it could be customized plans coming to you uh, do you see that happening sooner later now that you have a unified view so uh, in the next couple of years a large part of the challenge also is the way insurance uh, pricing is done sonia That's so you right. pool for a risk right? right and in that risk pool you've got millions of people with varied uh, risks coming in and you know one offsets the other having said that with a lot of data coming in and the usage of iot data also coming in 
right. at least at base level you know pooling of customers and segments of customer getting similar pricing should be a reality soon right one on one hyper personalized plans i would say are still still a few years away even if you have the data fantastic great to know that there is um some uh, you know we have something coming up soon i'll move this question uh, to sushant uh, grofers and again another uh, company that is sitting on a lot of data uh, how are you looking at data and data driven marketing and strategies and especially post the pandemic what is changing for you sure. uh, sonia see we are an e grocery platform and uh, data sits at the center of the business is the heart of the business uh, data helps us to understand our consumers better the behavior on the platform better and this also helps us to kind of drive customization and better pla platform experience to, so that you know retention on the platform uh, is stable or goes up uh, you know very recent example you know pandemic uh, where you know data made a change or made us change our business strategy or marketing strategy uh you know when when the lockdown started uh i mean we were on the fortunate side i would say that we we experienced a massive surge of traffic on our platform everyone wanted to stock up and buy groceries because things were very unsure uh so so over a period of time when we analyzed the data we realized that uh, the entire consumer behavior on the platform has had changed drastically uh we we observed few data points like uh you know people who were aware non priors came back to the platform uh, people who had lapsed out came back uh, you know uh, uh, and started uh, engaging with us uh, again uh, the cart composition changed uh, people started spending more on uh, you know uh, necessities and less on indulgence cart sizes grew so the number of items in the cart went up because the in home in home consumption uh, uh, increased uh, the other part of i mean these are data signals that you get the other part of data is through insights when when you inciting uh, when you directly having one to one conversations with your uh, consumers across cohorts we figured out you know that particular time safety and you know value for money was the prime uh, primary anxiety of these consumers so all our marketing communications were also customized as per those anxieties uh, as we speak uh, things are getting normalized and this behavior uh, is is changing so data is very very critical for us uh, you know it is not only important uh, from a from a marketing standpoint but at an overall organization level because it does impact your supply your inventory your category uh, tech for product innovations so so yes i mean you can't escape uh, you know uh, data and it drives definitely drives your business strategy fair enough thank you uh my next question is basically that data give us gives us numbers proof points to make rational business decisions how do you balance rational versus emotional decision making something that you really feel from your gut and i will open this up to isha how do you look at balancing data and your emotional gut what's happening there yeah thank you sonia for that question um i think as you know everyone just spoke in the group uh, for us definitely there has never been a tipping point on data driven business decisions given that we are in the business of selling data driven decisions so for us if i had to choose i'll always choose data over gut but having said that uh, i think we are currently in a situation where host of the organizations and you know even situations uh, we have been talking about pandemic uh, we are looking at gut being either data plus or data solving being the situation of being gut plus i would say that you really cannot pick one out of the other because if you talk about you know numbers they give you a great uh, jumping off point but ultimately we are in the business of consumers ultimately you know we're talking about purchase patterns we are talking about consumer journeys they have a certain human element attached to them so yes data is super crucial it will be more about you know uh, like if i have to talk about strategy then uh, as bad as false data or the wrong source of data sonia equally bad could be the stubbornness on gut so does you know the emotional side of it and the gut size of it uh, it needs to be fairly balanced with data 
And what we've seen at NEPA after working on case on case and, you know, different studies and Sagar talked about this, you know, a situation of consumers never telling us what they really want. And uh, the journey for us has, you know, moved from, say, claim data to now more neural on your more neuroscience techniques and more passive data and behavioral, uh, behavioral data captures. But there have been recurring themes uh, when you talk about data and gut in particular. Like there's no magic formula in terms of proportions. But if I have to talk about guidelines that we propagate to a lot of our client partners, I'm just speaking agency voice. But the first one is uh, that, uh, you know, trying new things, uh, something that we saw during COVID. So creativity, uh, that's exactly where the marketing dividend was, right? Irrespective of what data was saying or gut was saying, uh, creativity really helped. So the first thing is trying out new things when you are in the debacle of choosing data versus gut. Uh, the second would be do not blindly trusting either. Like data could be a great trust multiplier. It could be a great gut multiplier versus gut when it's really telling you what to do and you have, you know, the data which is just not speaking as your intuition is. So do not just going by, you know, what the pivot tables are really talking through the numbers. Uh, if I, you know, have to give a very simple example um, of again pandemic because that's the most recent where we can you know like align both of them could we imagine uh, you know we believing by gut or by data that a very nice looking decadent moist cake is something that is going to attract you know a consumer it completely failed right like people really wanted everything to be health they wanted to know what's inside it they wanted to know what is the ingredient inside it because uh, every business suddenly became health business, right from food and, uh, you know, working out to even something that is not even remotely related to health. So that's, a, you know, like a very simple example of where the gut and data sort of completely failed us. The debate sort of failed us. The third guideline, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that I have been at least noting down for myself, given that we often come at situations where we are asked, this is no, this is what the marketing budgets are. This is what the creative team is saying. This is what the content is at, but your data is not speaking in line. So the third is that, you know, gut definitely improves with age and experience. So gut definitely improves with more and more use cases. So more, you know, as we go along, gut and data definitely start talking, at least remotely talking parallelly to each other. And uh, the last one, you know, coming back to what Apoor quoted, to what even Sagar quoted and Anika quoted about, the, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the side of things of uh, technology uh, that we have, but realizing that we are dealing with humans, keeping the business still human, and then taking that, you know, that rational divide of data and gut is where I leave it at. Uh, not choosing really between the two, but seeing how one is helping the other. So I think the takeout for me is yeah. definitely data first, but yes. don't ignore your gut as long as you're experienced. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, I will actually uh, take this up to um, Hitu. Hitu, uh, what has your experience been uh, data plus, uh, uh, you know, is it emotional? Is it rational? What is it that you guys are doing at Microsoft? So, well, I, let me just start by saying there's no arguing with the saying uh, that data is the new currency. I think we heard it across all the examples that we've shared. It is practically driving everything from business decisions, innovations, uh, to literally our everyday living. But I would say what is equally important is that you balance that data with human touch. Because yes, uh, in, in a marketing context, data is critical uh, to our marketing efforts because it helps you identify your audiences, boost your creatives, create demand even before it exists, all of that goodness that we just spoke about. But using data can be tricky because it often misses the context. Lean on it too much and your, uh, your messaging could become emotionless or worse, tone deaf to what's happening in the world. Uh, and don't use enough of it and you'll lose precious insights into your audience. So I'll, I'll share two examples where I uh, would say that it is both a foe or a friend. Uh, there's, I'll, I'll use a recent example. There was a post which, has been doing, which was doing the rounds on LinkedIn very recently, which was highlighting the flip side of leaning too much on an automated uh, model. I think it was a cosmetics brand uh, from the US and suddenly they started serving ads for, the black, uh, for black beauty products to non-black communities because they were interacting uh, with a number of posts on social media themed around racial injustice. 
Now, the algorithm that the company had built was clearly using rules to bucketize people based on keywords, volume of engagement. But what the uh, algorithm was missing or uh, could not understand was the developing situation in the world that provided the context of why these non-Black people were interacting with those posts. So um, in, yeah. in netting it out, I would say you want to let the data inform but not dictate uh, your actual message or your creative or the approach that you're taking. But at the same time, let me take another example. And there are multiple such instances where data or um, advanced technologies like AI and ML, they are playing a big supportive role in the, uh, in, in the world of marketing and content creation too. I'll take, an, take example of Disney. Uh, they're one of our customers and they're currently using AI to tell greater stories. So they have uh, AI based auto encoders to actually understand how audiences respond in real time to their films. Uh, the technology actually uses a night vision camera in movie halls to conduct sentiment analysis on our facial expressions, you know, to detect emotions like fear, surprise. So here you're using the data uh, or the technology essentially to be a co-creator with, with your content. It is influencing or it is telling you that the content that you've created or the storytelling that you're doing, whether it is effective or not. So in netting it out, to me, data is a guidepost, not the end game uh, to keep your decisions and messaging real. So it's a blend of the two. It's not an either or. Right, right, sure. So I would say um, still human intervention is very, very important in terms of making data-driven decisions. Um, also, pure play automation is something that one needs to be kind of uh, wary about. Yeah. Great, thanks. I'll move on to the next que question. Um, and uh, this is essentially addressing a lot of brands today are wanting to go D2C. Um, and, uh, and also from a perspective of that, not all of them can leverage an automation stack or a platform because of the efficiencies, right? You're talking about a million transactions, you know, and if there's a brand that's just making a headway into the, to the DTC kind of space, uh, when do you think should the brand plunge in terms of making the investments? And what should be the key takeouts for them when they're doing that, right? So I'll open this question to, again to Sagar because uh, we are talking FMCG and FMCG is not typically people who collect organizations that collect data. So, Sagar, over to you, please, on this one. I think uh, that's a very valid question, uh, uh, Sonia. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, one of the things that came that, uh, you know, everyone wanted to buy from the companies directly. And, you know, the whole buzz in the FMCG circles was that, you know, we have really missed the bus. You know, we never tried to do d 2 c uh, But I think one of the major points that we really missed that time is that let's not confuse an exigency for a business trend. And, uh, you know, many companies have tried and we realized after five, six months into the pandemic that it's not really panning out the way it does. So my uh, advice to anyone who really wants to go D2C is to really first look at the business model. Because I think we shouldn't put the, uh, uh, you know, we shouldn't put the card before the horse. It should, it should, uh, it should actually be the other way around. Uh, so fundamentally, if you are looking at an FMCG company, just the in offline universe, you are selling through like millions of retailers. You are selling through an offline uh, modern trade, uh, uh, you know, retailers like a Dmart or a Big Bazaar or a Reliance. Similarly, I think it's exactly the same way it will also pan out in the online space, primarily because of the economics and the aggregation of it. Having said that, as a company, you need to be very clear as to why you are wanting to do D2C. And I, while I would believe that there are no right or wrong answers to this, I will tell you the way we are looking at it. Because, uh, you know, I think there, 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 is a, there is a thought and there is a thinking that is gone behind it. We believe that uh, the D2C should really allow us to build quality audience. Because what really happens on most of the platform, most of the people who are coming, say, uh, on e-commerce platforms like a Grofers or a Big Basket or an Amazon, they're all light consumers who keep shifting between platforms and they keep shifting between brands. I think what as a brand you are missing is the depth and the quality of the consumer who is going to buy your brand consistently. So, uh, and you can use those consumers who could be lesser in number, but you can use those consumers as micro influencers. 
for a brand for a company like ours which is essentially all our offerings are really based on nutrition it makes a lot of a uh, lot of economic sense so the way we look at it is that uh, you know uh, as long as the d2c model is uh, is operationally uh, profit neutral and we are the the cost of maintaining the platform is what we consider the marketing investment and we are building say a 10000 customer hypothetically but they are buying uh, at least five or six ranges of my products regularly i think they are doing the purpose that we want they are serving the purpose that you want and you know then the same consumer you can use for market research the same consumer you can use tomorrow as micro influencers um, you know so there are there are a lot of the use cases that you can have but can i have like 5% or 10% of my business coming from d2c operations i think more from the cost and the time point of view it doesn't make sense so uh, i would urge everyone who is wanting to take the d2c plunge to essentially first look at the business logic for it and then really start looking at the tools like automation or creating a plan ui ux which is great uh, that that's the way i would look at it another follow up question in terms of do you see this trend uh, that people are buying online because they really not getting into retail uh, stores is just a trend and short lived or you really feel that this is going to happen because at the end of the day we are talking to the the younger audiences and the future family makers and all of them are very very comfortable with digital um, so from a long term perspective uh, what's your thoughts on that well i think the jury is still out and i will share what i think will happen uh, i i personally believe that uh, this as a trend uh, is here to stay uh, the, i think the the i mean once you are you are, you are basically and you know once you are addressing the first barrier uh, to online purchase, uh, purchase and people understand how easy and convenient it is uh, uh, to really buy online consumers would want to spend more time on things which are more meaningful as we are we are looking at the audiences which are younger we are we are talking about uh, uh, the gen z and we are talking about the millennials right we believe that you know they are wanting to seek more experiences and buying grocery going to the shop and buying grocery there you know is that's that's not an experience that really counts uh, i i think in in um, uh, for for that audience uh, so i i believe that uh, uh, you know the audience which has really come to the online platform i don't foresee that audience really receding significantly in the uh, in in the near term that's that's besides that that's that's what my opinion would be uh, i think we are, i mean only time will tell what how it pans out okay okay great i'll move this question now to sushant uh, what are your thoughts in terms of d2c uh, and when do you think companies should actually take it on what is the kind of uh, size that we are looking at for the for from a sales perspective that makes merit i mean uh, there is no right or wrong answer here and i get i get uh, this question a lot many times that what is what is the size uh, of the base uh, that you should look at uh, you know from uh, from for data automation and uh, you know uh, see it's it's any any and every company which is into the consumer space you know and is uh, uh, looking at the kind of competition the clutter that is growing in each of the category you need to uh, put data very very um, you know look at it very seriously uh, secondly uh, i mean you you need to invest or build into that uh, a plunge into that ecosystem see it also depends on the objectives and the growth uh, you know uh, trajectory of the company or the vision of the company uh, initially you might not a kind of uh, 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 invest heavily into building that ecosystem but and but then it is important for you to understand your consumers better uh, so that you know you you can you can have that business growth so therefore investing in a data automation data ecosystem is very very critical uh, to to understand uh, your your business and your consumers better sure so you saying that uh, primarily it's just not about sales but to understand your consumer behavior is also another big uh, takeaway when you look at uh, automation tools and marketing automation tools yes i i think you have to at some point in time build, build that ecosystem uh, uh, because otherwise it, is, it will be very difficult to kind of gather that intelligence of consumer and because see at the end of the day today it is all about customization right 
Uh, I mean, each each uh, consumer on the platforms behaves behaves very dis- differently. So, so from a from an offering perspective, from a communication perspective, you have to drive that uh, customization uh, for for better experience, platform experience. Fair enough. I'll move this to Apoorv now. Apoorv, what is the minimal threshold if you want to be light in terms of an automation platform, a marketing automation platform? Um, you know, we've got uh, views here, uh, uh, you know, Sagar essentially has spoken about it has to be uh, in terms of uh, a long-term view before you get into it. And we have Sushant also saying that uh, for us to better understand and to target, it kind of works. So what is the minimum threshold if you were to look at the marketing automation stack, what would you recommend? Super. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Sonia. Uh, I think uh, what I'm hearing across the panel is that, you know, we have data and we have context to that data and no decision can be taken without seeing data in the context of sorts. I think that's the larger message that I kind of read and that's fairly correct as well, right? Like, for example, uh, nothing can be seen absolute, right? For example, for someone 100 could be large enough, for someone 100 could be very small. Um, and, you know, it changes with time and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a multi-dimensional sort of a scenario. So my take on this per se, uh, this is my perspective from what I see across uh, domains, you know, uh, that we deal in. One is, uh, I think uh, there are two sides of the funnel for any business. I think one is called acquisition, which is getting a customer on board to actually, you know, be aware and be familiar with a product category brand. And second is uh, retention, right? Which is basically getting to purchase and then repurchase loyalty and so on. So right? I, that's how I break it up. I think the way to take a decision whether you want to deploy a marketing automation system or not is basis where do you stand in terms of the impact on the funnel. If you're yet figuring out very early and you're a small business, again, context changes, right? I'm assuming someone who's yet not figured out the acquisition model is very early in its own business, whether B2C or not, or B2C businesses. Uh, then they need to focus on first actually enabling some sort of awareness and familiarity about them, making sure whether, you know, if there's a real estate shop, then get customers inside that shop. Uh, if there is an online shop, then, you know, or we're selling a product or service, then making sure there's some awareness and familiarity and people are getting onto your website or map, checking things out, playing around, get that part fixed first. If that is fixed first and you see some bit of trend of buying happening, right, which basically is customers saying, hey, you know, I read about your product or service, it makes some sense. And, you know, a few of them end up buying. And I, you see that trend growing, going, right? And before that, I think you have a lot of analytics to catch up because you're looking at trends and so on and so forth, right? And optimizing for the top of the funnel to get people in. I think till then, I would always suggest anybody should use very easy and free products. Very easy, light, very, very analytical, very data-driven products and optimize on the top of the funnel. Now, once you're in and you see some buying happening, now first, again, as I said, I would say, for someone, you know, 100 purchases would be something. Like, for example, a grocery business, right? 100 purchases might not need anything. But for a real estate business, 100 purchases might just be everything that they ever wanted in a, in a quarter or in a financial year. So, you know, depending on the product category, uh, whichever you fall into, uh, if you feel that there is some traction and trends being seen and people are buying, I think that's from that place. I think it's a very contextual thing that you figure out a way that if someone's buying, how do I make sure that he comes and buys again from me? Because depending on the product that you are, whether you're buying an insurance, right? You will either renew it or purchase somewhere else the next year. But you're buying grocery. If you bought it, like say, you know, set of, let's say you bought a set of diapers, you know, which has a certain packaging size, you're going to replenish it, right? So you're going to either buy from this platform product, you know, that same business or you're going to buy it from somewhere else. So once you have some buying purchase happening, you need to figure out how do you enhance cross-sell, upsell sort of use cases, your loyalty, and you go into, you know, these funnel, buying funnel standpoint. I think that's when you actually start leveraging a marketing automation or an engagement or any of that sort of a platform. Till then, I would always advise, keep it simple, focus on your core practices, core values, look at more data and trends and use as much free products. So there's enough free online. You don't always have to pay. That's the beauty of SaaS and what we're building globally, right? Great, of course. So primarily look at your funnel, 
and uh, essentially invest as you go forward when you say, see traction. I have a follow-up question very quickly. Um, and that's really about building data, your first party data, right? Uh, and uh, I will actually take this up to Sagar. What is it that you're doing in terms of building your first party data? And Anika, since you have a lot of data, any advice for us? Sagar? Yeah. So Sonia, as uh, you as you would know, for the most of the FMCG companies, you don't have first party data because the actual consumer transaction is happening at the retailer place, and large part of the retail universe is in mom and pop stores where, anyways, you don't have the data. So one of the things that we are doing for building our first party data uh, is we have created a content destination called as startupnutricorner.com, wherein we are we are, we are we are created content which really essentially uh, uh, is created around the theme of. Uh, importance of Indian nutrition in everyday diet. Uh, and we believe that uh, psychographically, that's a big trend that many people believe, uh, you know, eat local, eat seasonal is a global, globally a very, very big trend. Uh, and if you're looking at from the Indian context, people always believe that Ghar uh, Khana and the wisdom that was passed uh, from our grandmothers, uh, I think there was something very valuable about it. And this platform essentially, uh, you know, uh, you know, doles out content on this. We have been working with big influencers like Luke Putino, uh, Kavita Devgan, uh, and you know, we keep having various content ideas around this particular thing. We had uh, during COVID, we had something called as Hardin Haldi, wherein there was some, uh, we had around uh, uh, around 300 content creators who created innovative ways of using Haldi in every single day diet. I think what this is doing is we are getting a sort of audience on this platform who is psychographical and behaviorally homogeneous. I think what you, if you have to build your data strategy, uh, fundamentally building a demographically homogeneous audience is very easy. You can just go to any third party data provider and you will get that. But right. building a behaviorally and uh, uh, you know psychographically homogeneous audience where we believe, where you believe that they will have higher affinity for your brand, I, I don't think there is any solution that really exists and that is a fundamental starting point for us. Uh, we have been on this journey for, for close to a year now and we believe that it has paid us uh, hugely. Uh, we get around a million of audience uh, every single month on that platform, out of which at least 20% of the audience is organic. And understanding that audience regularly, time and again, and building that lookalike audiences from there, uh, we, you know, what is what it is really helping us is improving both the efficiency and effectiveness of our marketing campaigns. Uh, and, and that's the way we look at it. Right. Thanks, Agar. I'll actually pass this on to Isha. Uh, Isha, what are your thoughts in terms of collecting first-party data? So, um, you know, I would, I have a, almost a similar opinion already cited in terms of, uh, you know, the homogeneity of data that we're talking about. But I would echo strongly, you know, the, the point that uh, Sagar just talked about, which is the psychographic side of it. Uh, and the problem that we are struggling with, I mean, we're talking about clickstream data, a lot of third-party data. And secondly, uh, you know, uh, psychographic, because the social cultural nuances in the country are so vivid that if we just have to depend upon, you know, third party data, which is existing, uh, looking at that ROI is going to be like a, like, like that's not the best ideology. You know, the actionability based on just the data, which is existing by different sources is not the best ideology. So one source, which is a challenge, there is definitely not an answer, but carefully deriving the algorithm of answering two questions, which is where to play and how to win which is, which exactly are the cohorts that you are playing with and what are then the touch points and omni channels, you know, the different channels that you're using to really, you know, uh, crack them up is the way to go. So one source and psychographic is uh, definitely where my heart is in terms of, uh, you know, answering your point on uh, first party data. Right. And what are the great touch points you can gather that kind of data? Is it uh, by way of uh, surveys? For I mean, how do you get voluminous data in, in that specific yeah. regard? Yeah. So, uh, so, so multiple ways of gathering it. Of course, there is primary data, which is by the virtue of doing surveys, by interventions, et cetera, et cetera. You have to carefully invest in them, not necessarily existing. Also, uh, very important, you know, something that we have been seeing that everyone, uh, you know, one request that keeps on coming to us, which is, yes, we want to do something in digital and we want digital data and we want the online data. But a lot of times not really, uh, like, you know, not really knowing that where in the whole, you know, the funnel that we're talking about digital really sits. Is digital really impacting the top funnel? Is digital really impacting the bottom funnel? Uh, is making the product look more Instagrammable really going to lead to a purchase? 
is you know investing into a youtube vlog video really going into a purchase so that uh, that that leads to the second point which is uh, primary data is definitely not enough because there you face the enemy of what the person is claiming versus what they are actually feeling uh, secondly uh, click stream data which is widely available in app data that is you know a lot used in terms of fusing the data to the responses but uh, if you look at you know multiple sources on here that we are discussing one point that doesn't change is quantifying the roi which is how powerful each touch point is in the journey how powerful each touch point is in that omni channel path is i think the bigger question because the sources are like a plenty today like right. the brands agencies we all have a lot of data and the second is the efficacy which is quantification of the power and secondly what is the effectiveness of that data in the whole path to purchase or even the path to viewership now because content is what we are consuming like we were purchasing yeah, yeah, yeah. so so you know it it's actually both path to purchase and path to viewership uh, because we used to talk about ropo and then we used to talk about ropa and now it's like uh, it's the new term is uh, you know people are searching anywhere and purchasing anywhere the the whole path to purchase is broken so so vividly that uh, quantification and efficacy is super crucial okay great so i'll actually uh, be running out of time and uh, we have some questions here so we'll have to drop the fifth question that we'd planned um so i'll i'll read the question and then you guys can decide who's going to take this this is akash singh and he says if organizations have built multiple sources of data how can they avoid the trap of data silos for example different datas might be related but the teams may not find the trend because of lack of experience um i leave it to the panel to kind of take this on anika would you like to take that on sure so i think uh, we all spoke about the fact that you may have a lot of data but it's all broken and fragmented and we did speak about getting it all together into a data lake i think that's the first point and then we also spoke about you know how different teams will use data i think the objectives for each will be different and if you can define the objective that your team carries it's much easier to then create use cases so for example a very simple objective could be let's look at the customer lifetime value and see which are the data points out of the data sets available in our data lake which uh, impact that the most and then hence a communication team uh, will you know use it for channel orchestration an acquisition team will probably use it for creating local likes and adding third party and psychographic data to you know uh, to in increase and improve conversions and somebody else may use it to drive up profitability so i think uh, two three key things one have the data in one source have the larger organization objective and your team's objective very clear uh, keep always a profitability and a lifetime value lens and then build your use cases on that data fantastic and this is coming from someone who has a unified uh, uh, you know like a look of the data that's available anika you spoke about it initially yeah yeah i we have another question by gk and that goes uh, he says do you have a view on social dilemma the movie that was on netflix <laughs> you need stronger regulations for social media yes we do uh, but uh, and that's where we get all our data what is a uh, point of view there uh, hitu would you like to take that so won't I have a point of view on it is Absolutely. what i would yeah. say uh, and i think there is enough enough out there in terms of uh, the movie itself the documentary itself says i think the important thing is uh, when you're talking about technology uh, and I, as i'd mentioned earlier it can be a foe it can be a friend uh, what is and when these companies had started and the the documentary says it i don't think anyone was intently there wasn't mal intention in terms of collecting that data or using it for the purposes that they were but given if there isn't governance and if there isn't someone who's uh for lack of a better word is using policing th there has to be certain industry norms of how we are using data uh and that is very critical and you are seeing that you're seeing that with the gdprs and various others across countries but how uh how effective is it for each company and for us as end uh, customers to actually imbibe by them use them and make it real and not as a concept i think that something 
uh, which is evolving and we have to wait and see. Okay. So we have to have policing for sure. But when I saw the movie, I actually went off uh, Facebook and Instagram instantaneously. And I said, well, I'm not using it. Because at the end of the day, what you're discussing is also getting displayed and relayed as ads. So it is kind of a bit scary, you know, just conversations converting to ads. But I think uh, just to kind of sum up uh, today's conversation, thank you guys. You were a fantastic audience. And uh, I think the key takeout uh, for us has been that it's going to be a data-driven world as we move forward. We need to balance ourselves in terms of definitely be data plus and gut plus gut plus more from your experience and what you feel is right. Move towards to what Anika said, that you look at a, a, a unified view of data, coming more from what is it that you want out of, the, of data. Sagar primarily talking more about, does it mean a, make a business case? Uh, Apoorv augmenting it by primarily talking about a lot of free tools, Wait it before you kind of deep dive into it, see some traction before it goes. And obviously Sushant also had a lot of uh, great recommendations for us from, from someone who was uh, coming from Grofers, which is really a great marketplace and you know, they, they sit on a lot of data. So uh, great Friday to you guys and everybody who came in and watched this uh, episode of uh, MarTech. Uh, thank you, Exchange for Media, for getting us all here. Thank you, Priyanka. You were great and you got us all together. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody.